Good morning, everyone. This is Ray Cool. I'm the CEO of PBSI Technology Solutions, and very happy today to be presenting security essentials in healthcare. So this is information that we've gained about security in healthcare over a large number of years of providing security in a healthcare environment. And our uh, goal today will be to educate and inform, and very happy to be engaged with uh, RVPI. So thanks for your attendance. Ed, as leader of the group, you wanna make a comment? Sure, I do. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, to begin with, I heard this morning that uh, from the administration, the national administration, uh, right on down, cybersecurity is a pretty important uh, aspect of where the government needs to attend, uh, attend to. And um, we probably need another 300,000 people that are trained in cybersecurity uh, to protect the nation against the hackers and so forth. Um, but on a more uh, personal level, I just want to tell you that I've known Ray Cool for probably 20 years, I think, uh, working with PBSI Technology Solutions over that period of time in various capacities, working with them to, to, to do provide services for the organizations that I've been with over a period of time. And um, Ray has done a tremendous job of keeping up with what's going on in security, but also in healthcare. And I think you'll be pleased to uh, hear what he has to say. Uh, so go ahead, Ray. Thank you, Ed. Okay, so welcome everybody again. This morning, we're going to review uh, some recent security events for perspective, and we'll cover the essential elements in healthcare security, which um, we'll go into detail, including risk assessments, uh, password policies, some settings that are important, uh, timeout settings, multi-factor authentication. We'll cover uh, encrypting patient data, uh, the importance of remote access security, a, key, a couple of key elements about backup, and we'll summarize. So this content uh, we've gathered and continue to modify from learnings, um, frankly, every day. And our goal is simply to educate and inform. And um, I know that there will be some things I'll cover that each listener will already know, and that's uh, completely understood. Hopefully there's something of value to everyone. So for those of you not familiar with PBSI, we provide technology services and security services in healthcare with hundreds of providers as clients over a long number of years, with uh, clients all over Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. And as CEO, I'm blessed to be able to uh, say and know that 75% of our staff have been with PBSI for many, many years, 10 years or more, and I know that knowledge helps clients, and that's um, a very important thing. So from the active learning that we do, uh, today's information comes. Why do we need protection? Um, you are, quote, the smart people in the room attending, and Ed, for requesting this kind of information be uh, distributed to RVPI staff. Uh, but it's no surprise to anyone who even slightly listens to the news that uh, attacks are increasing. And of course, the most publicized events are large organizations, but what we see under the surface is particularly in healthcare, not only, but certainly in healthcare, attacks are increasing. And uh, one of the things that's made this uh, more and more dangerous is that malware is typically in a different form today than it used to be where if you got a virus, you'd be notified. And now you've got a message on your screen, now you've got a ransomware warning. Increasingly, malware is not only transforming quickly with 350,000 approximate variations per day, uh, but threats are not always recognized. Increasingly, they sit behind the surface and they just watch. They log keystrokes, they log passwords. And, uh, Increasingly, 
the uh, occurrence of what's called zero day attacks or zero days is uh, proliferating. And what that means is we have zero days to prepare because the attack morphs electronically with each iteration. So if 50 practices are attacked, uh, the learning process that takes place among firewalls and security software is uh, based on understanding what an attack looked like that happened an hour ago or a day ago. And a zero day attack can be hidden, uh, not recognizable by the security prevention you have in place. Therefore, it means all of us need to pay attention in a different way. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how do we pay attention? Um, the recent SolarWinds hack has been very well publicized, uh, but that is really just one in a sea. It's a very important one, but one in a sea of attacks. And increasingly, we're seeing that uh, software companies, security software companies, are being um, attacked, meaning that the security tools you have in place may in fact not be reliable. So that's a, I'm not trying to fear monger. Uh, what I'm trying to do is uh, make clear the reason for this longstanding policy, but increasingly important, is that security must be multi-layered. Um, and multi-layered means you have more than one layer of defense so that you have a firewall that blocks from the outside world, you have antivirus on the desktop, you have uh, patch updates that are taking place. Each layer of defense is there because what if the layer before or after fails? So the good news is it's not difficult, it's not expensive, it's simply important to attend. And what we're going to do is talk about what are the various components of effective multilayer defense. This slide uh, just captures screenshots of some recent attacks. Uh, this one that I've highlighted in yellow was from this January, ransomware up 45% in healthcare, um, average of 626 cyber attacks on healthcare organizations per week. Uh, and that's increasing. So uh, divide that by the number of states and think of the likelihood that a cyber attack has happened uh, in Cincinnati or Northern Kentucky in the last uh, week. And it, uh, we have our heads up. So hackers are stealing millions of medical records, um, you know, various, th th there are just so many examples of these. Uh, here's a pediatric practice um, that was Attack, uh, ransomware attack exposes 45,000 patient records. These are not large organizations. These are just like uh, you, organizations serving in their local communities, and nobody's immune. And this uh, identifies something that's uh, relatively important to understand, and that is where are the attacks coming from? Very few are coming from electronic medical records because those are generally well protected, the data is encrypted, and that's not uh, the source. Uh, the biggest source is email. And one of the things we're gonna talk about today is email security and how we can set it up, what we need to attend to. Um, everybody has received an email from somebody who you're on their contact list. They send you an email with an invoice or a purchase order or a, some kind of a special. And you think, why did that person send this to me? Well, their email has been hacked and that's, um, just something that's happening today. One of the main reasons that it's uh, so frequent that emails are hacked are exposed passwords. I'm gonna talk about that a bit because understanding exposed passwords, how they create risk and how we can mitigate is important. And it comes down to each of us individually. This is the overall NIST cybersecurity framework, National Institute of uh, Technology Standards. And uh, it is the same essential framework as HIPAA requires. So, uh, and the word requires, there are variables that are permitted within this framework, but the basic idea that we need to identify where our technology is, we need to put place uh, tools in place to protect those electronic assets. We need to be able to detect, meaning ongoing monitoring processes, and we need to have plans in place to respond and recover. So those are the essentials and the details underneath we're going to talk just a bit about. In healthcare, what is an overview of what multi-layered security looks like? We're going to protect our perimeter. We're going to secure our data, protect our endpoints. That's our PCs, laptops, Macs, um, iPads. We're going to uh, 
protect our email, really important topic. And I, the things I've put in red in this PowerPoint today are things of particular focus. So we'll dive into email security a bit more and we need to monitor our network. So some of the basics, uh, much of which is taken care of at an organizational level. So as an individual staff member in a healthcare practice, I can't really change these things, um, but as an administrator or a manager, we should be aware. So firewalls are the very first blocking and tackling aspect of security where we put a firewall in place to essentially block all pings from the outside unless they're specifically permitted. And we, having a firewall is only part of the equation. These are not expensive devices and setting them up appropriately is not expensive either. But one of the key things is we're going to set our firewall to run silent. You go to Micro Center, you buy a firewall, don't know how to set it up, uh, almost you might as well not have it. So that's not a criticism. I'm simply saying that uh, firewalls need to be set appropriately and run silent means that when pings from the outside come and they come by the hundreds of thousands every day, the firewall blocks those pings from reaching each individual device inside of the organization. So very important that we're uh, minimizing our quote attack surface instead of having our attack surface be every PC in the organization. Now our attack surface is one firewall per location. So setting them to run silent means that when somebody pings the bad guys, um, what version of software do you have? The firewall simply doesn't respond and hackers don't know what's behind the surface. Otherwise, pings come in and they're pinging each PC. What rev of Windows do you have? What rev of Office do you have? And so forth. And the information that they learn then um, provides information to attack. So having firewalls secured with the appropriate software and securing home connections. I'll talk a little bit more about this. And there are some technical details about firewall setup. I won't go into uh, today, but always you're welcome to uh, ask us. By the way, uh, some of you listening are PBSI clients. Thank you very much. Your long-term partnership is appreciated. Um, and any of you who wish uh, information and follow-up, just ask. Uh, so we're going to secure our perimeter. We're going to protect our data. This actually is one where uh, most organizations are better protected than in some other areas. We want to make sure we have backup in place so that if our data is compromised, that we can recover. This is one where most organizations are in pretty good shape. We protect our servers. Uh, there's a category of software that we've been supplying at PBSI for some time now called Endpoint Detection and Response, EDR, which is a category of software that specifically protects against ransomware. Uh, the software we use called Sentinel-1 has a feature that can undo a ransomware attack if one were to occur uh, with a rollback button. But the vendor says, and I say the vendor says because there's no such thing uh, as a guarantee in the security world, the vendor says if you have Sentinel-1 on your server, you cannot be um, no device protected by Sentinel-1 can be um, attacked by ransomware or can be successfully attacked. Uh, access control. So this is another area that's protecting our data by having our administrative accounts and passwords set correctly. Uh, protecting our endpoints, our PCs and our laptops. This is the interior layer of defense that's really important. And I would think that most organizations listening, this is in place. You have antivirus and malware protection on your individual units because if an attack happens, then you have something there on the device actually watching and uh, seeing and preventing and blocking and uh, quarantining and deleting. That's the purpose of antivirus is if something does go wrong, you minimize the um, severity of the attack. An important thing is patch management. Patch management means that we keep all of our software up to date on all of our devices. Again, this is set automatically on most devices, but if you as an end user at a PC see a message, uh, do you want to permit this update? I'm not talking about purchasing the next version of a piece of software, but the security updates that are uh, automatically sent regularly by Microsoft, Adobe, Apple, all the major software vendors. The answer is yes, you want to let that patch update. And if you're a PC says, do you want to reboot now? You don't have to do it now, but uh, please, yes, reboot. 
This is the process of patch management that takes place automatically on all devices. And um, what it does is make sure that when vendors like Microsoft identify security vulnerabilities and they fix the vulnerabilities and they distribute the fix, that that is installed on a timely basis. Why is that important? Because when patches are released for security problems, the vendor announces to the rest of the world, including the bad guys, here's what we fixed. We found we had a flaw that allowed somebody to do X, Y, Z, and now the bad guys have been alerted, hmm, didn't know what to do that, and they try and uh, develop software that gets under the surface and allows them to take control of computers where the rev of that particular application is prior to this recent security release. So there's a, a game, it's not at all a game, it's very serious, but there's a process going on where vendors, Microsoft, Apple, Adobe, so forth, uh, fix security vulnerabilities, and our role as end users is to make sure that those patches get updated. One thing we do at PBSI for everyone uh, who's a client is we make sure these patches are not only up to date, but we uh, take care of failures and we're behind the scenes making sure. And this is uh, whoever your IT vendor is, they're likely doing the same thing. It's important that your patches are up to date. So, um, and then vulnerability scans are run regularly. These are the things that are the basic blocking and tackling of PCs and laptops. Email security and employee training. I won't uh, discuss this here because I'm gonna dive in a little deeper, but this is really important and something where we all can participate uh, and it's important we have some understandings. An increasing area of attack is what's called the Internet of Things, IoT, and those are the things that are connected to the Internet, but they aren't um, PCs or laptops or Macs. That would be your network switches, your wireless access points, your uh, refrigerators, your televisions, temperature sensors, cameras, uh, so many things today are connected to the internet, internet, and inside of a medical office, you have uh, various lab equipment that's connected to your wireless network. And all of these things are susceptible, since they're connected to the internet, to vulnerabilities. And uh, there have been um, regular occurrences of internet devices where vulnerabilities are established and they're attacked. And there's a simple fix, keep your firmware updated, but I'll talk about that in more detail. So this is the overview of security. I'm now going to uh, dive into, for specific employees, what are the things I can do to keep my desktop and laptop, my work environment secure? And then we're gonna move to email security after this. So a very important topic is passwords. Um, passwords are a problem for everyone. How do we remember and keep our passwords um, secure? And the ultimate answer is, we can't keep our passwords secure. What we have to do is keep our passwords unique. What I mean by this is when uh, we store, th there are billions of password, login and password combinations that are available virtually for free, for less than pennies on the dollar on, uh, for sale on the dark web. And we have a tool to inquire and we can see exactly how many there are and we can look for each organization and see how many exposed passwords are out there for your organization. At PBSI, for example, we're a very secure organization. We pay attention to passwords. At last uh, query, there were 67 exposed password combinations where somebody with a PBSI net uh, email address, there's an exposed password combination out there. Well, how can that happen? The answer is, any of us, we store our login and password on a website that we trust, Anthem. Um, Facebook was recently hacked. Um, wherever we're storing our passwords, then that organization gets hacked, and now our passwords are compromised, and they're out there for sale, and that same password combination of my email address and my password can then be used by whoever wants to purchase those for you know, virtually nothing, they can be tried on every bank and credit card uh, organization in the world. That same password combination can be tried to hack into anybody's email. Uh, and so password reuse is a very, very uh, significant issue. And the 
management of passwords, uh, it's just not a simple thing. My recommendation is use a password manager. But many folks uh, just uh, can't, w won't. So what I want to say is don't use the same password, at least on key sites. Don't use the same password ever. But that's a tall order for uh, many folks. So on your work email, on any work site, make sure your password is unique compared to where you've used anywhere else. And never store written passwords around your desk or keyboard. We still regularly see post-it notes on monitors in clients' offices where the password is um, you know, written there. And it's not funny, but um, it certainly is a cliche. But that means uh, when your password is written there, then the cleaning crew or whoever else uh, comes by now has access to whatever you have access to. Uh, web links and attachments, be very careful. I'll talk more about this. Um, software downloads. In an organization, our recommendation is we have a policy, and this would be your own individual practice. No software downloads of any kind on my PC unless approved by my manager. So I go to my manager and I say, is it okay to download this software? And the manager says, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, how could I know? And But the point is then, someone else is engaged, your IT company, your um, upper level management, and the result of this policy is people just don't download software. There's no reason to download applications unless they're specifically required for job duties, and that certainly includes screensavers, weather apps, coupon sites, anything that's free. These downloads are the most common places to hide malware, and once you've downloaded it, uh, it can be very difficult to detect and very difficult to uninstall. So uh, stay away from software downloads. It keeps my PC clean. It's not just a performance thing, it's a security thing. Keep my patches up to date on my PC. Hopefully this is done automatically for you uh, by your IT vendor, but it's important. And when you see that message that says, do you want to update this patch, the answer is yes. Power settings. Uh, this is a, a contrary to what a lot of people have been told. We recommend you leave PCs on all the time. Instead of having your PC turn off at night, set a screensaver on your PC that requires a password when it uh, goes dark after whatever period of time you select. And a screensaver with a password is just as secure in terms of preventing access to your PC as turning your PC off. But leaving power on all the time permits the things that should take place at night to happen at night. That means patch updates, that means reboots, that means uh, downloads of uh, uh, vulnerability scans that are supposed to run at night. And this actually improves performance because then you don't come in on Monday morning or the next morning and find your PC to take uh, X period of time in order to, quote, wake up because what it's really doing is it's doing what it should have done and wanted to do last night, but it was turned off. So leave your power on, set a screensaver with a password. This is, uh, improves your security, uh, doesn't make it worse. And then email, hopefully everyone in healthcare knows email is not secure and we may not send an email that has any PHI, social security numbers, credit card numbers, dates of birth, ICDs, CPTs, all these things. Uh, if you're going to include any of this in an email, it must be encrypted. So the encrypting email is a simple thing to accomplish, but uh, it's important that everybody knows that, and hopefully that's not new information to anybody listening. And back up, I wanna say, this should be an individual responsibility. Um, we talk to folks all the time, and again, my comments aren't critical, I'm trying to inform, but uh, I have conversations about backup, and it includes, are your files backed up? Well, I think so, I hope so, yeah, I'm pretty sure they are. Um, how are they backed up? Who's looking at it? I uh, don't know, but I'm presuming it's being handled well. The uh, answer is, each of us is responsible to make sure that we know that our files are backed up. So I'm tr not trying to turn front desk staff into IT people. Uh, what I am doing is, if I'm storing a file and it's on my desktop, unless my PC is backed up, that file's not backed up. If I'm storing it on my C drive, um, unless the organization has made some kind of unusual provision, those files aren't backed up. So if I'm using a file in an organization, it's my responsibility to make sure basically that I know where it's being stored and that it's stored in a location where the file's backed up. So there's personal responsibility involved in this. 
And if you don't know, uh, ask your manager. Um, and your manager will know, or they'll ask IT. Okay, email. I'm going to talk about email specifically, and this uh, information on this slide is really for email administrators. So this would be managers or the IT, uh, and I'm not a technician personally. I'm not trying to turn anyone into a technician, so I won't uh, go into great detail here, but one of the main things I want to say about email is require multi-factor authentication for your email. Multi-factor authentication, as you likely know, is where your personal device, usually your phone, gets involved either with a text or with a authenticator application that if an email is hacked, which can happen, and it happens all the time where, just in my example, where I used the same password on my email that I used on Anthem that was hacked, and now somebody's gotten a hold of my email, now they can use that to send um, emails to people outside or inside of the organization. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had, health, had a healthcare client who didn't have multi-factor authentication turned on, and uh, an employee's email was hacked. From that, they learned the CEO's email, and ultimately they sent the quote CEO sent, didn't really, but the email came from the CEO to all employees saying, um, for the good of this good and valid reason, everybody please go buy three gift cards and do this with them. And two or three employees actually did that. And um, it turned out, of course, that they trusted the email because it came from the CEO, but it didn't really come from the CEO, their email was hacked. What does multi-factor authentication have to do with this? If an email is hacked, in order to be able to use that email to send the email that I just mentioned from the CEO, the device has to be approved from which the email is being sent. So multi-factor authentication, if a hacker gets a hold of your email and tries to use it, you on your phone get a message that says, a new user in Jupiter, Florida wants to um, use your email, is that okay? And when you say no, you prevent the successful hack of your email from actually being used. So it's really important. Microsoft strongly recommends it. PBSI strongly recommends it. Uh, if you're a PBSI client and you're not using this now, just get in touch with us. Uh, we'll help you through the communication process and turning this on. It's a small hassle for the important protection. So I'm focusing on that because it's something that we can really do and should do, each of us. Uh, another, if you use Microsoft 365, implement the $2 a month option called Microsoft Defender for 365. Uh, it used to be called Advanced Threat Protection, ATP. This is an important protection in that if you click, make a click mistake in an email, instead of uh, that click resulting in uh, something bad, Microsoft sends all clicks through a sandbox in the cloud and, uh, in, and fully explode everything that's going to happen with that. And instead of receiving malware, you simply get a message that says that link was malicious. And whenever that happens, you realize. I was just saved because that free gift card or whatever it is that fooled me into clicking uh, would have delivered a payload to my PC that I really didn't want to be there. So it's a, an inexpensive protection. So these are a couple of things. That's an organizational thing. And then there are some um, technical setup things, setting a transport rule. Of, when the bad guys get a hold of an email, they almost always set some rules inside of that account and one of them is, if somebody replies to an email that's sent, don't deliver it to this email address. Instead, auto-forward it to a different one. And so when somebody's email is hacked and they send it out to something bad to 100 people and the 100 people reply back, hey, your email has been hacked, the sender, the real sender, never gets that message. So again, these are easy to fix, but um, important to implement. And implement email encryption. Make sure that those clinical staff who need to send emails can do so uh, with PHI, can do so via encryption. Um, so enough said about, there's more detail here for somebody who's an administrator. I'm going to focus now on email. Uh, how do I evaluate a bad email? There are five specific principles that I'm going to uh, talk about, and I'll do this briefly, but um, I'm going to um, review these. So principle number one, 
pay attention to email so you don't make a click mistake. Understand the difference between solicited and unsolicited email. So unsolicited means unrequested and unexpected, even from a known source. So Ray from PBSI sends you an email. If you requested information and Ray responds, fine, that's requested, it's solicited. But if you receive an email from Ray and it's unsolicited, you need to evaluate the context. So if you get a webinar invitation from Ray and you expect that, okay, that's somewhere in between. But if you get an email from Ray, presumably a trusted source, and it's something out of context or I didn't request this, then you just need to pay attention to that email in a much more careful way. The message here is don't trust the sender to be who they say they are. Anything unusual about this email? Hover over the sender name. Um, it's amazing that sender names on emails, the email is crafted very carefully, but the sender name is uh, obviously not um, who they claim to be. So careful about emails from known persons. Uh, understand that we pay attention to unsolicited email more carefully. Generally, antenna up. Principle two, maybe should be principle one. Does anything seem amiss? Do I need to click on this now, or do I need to click on it at all? Um, time of day, recipient list, brief content, out of character. Why would this person send this information to me? Anything unusual, misspellings, grammar, phrasing, colors, formatting, font variations. Not all bad email comes from non-English speakers, but a significant number do. And a just careful review sometimes will help. And when, when anything seems amiss, then stop right there. Um, better safe than sorry. OK, principle three, don't get news from email. It can be uh, almost assured that you're going to receive an email from purportedly from a news source, from CNN or Fox News or whoever, and it has no bearing whether you actually listen to that news source. This would be generically sent to tons of people. And tax time, Olympics, disasters, holiday messages, celebrity news, any disaster that occurs, these will. Um, the bad guys will use these, and you'll get a message, disaster just happened in Los Angeles, uh, donate now, or it's uh, frequently the same day. And I uh, have a couple of vivid recollections of receiving emails from events where I thought, wow, I didn't know that was true. Well, it, it wasn't true. Somebody sent news that seemed very interesting in an email, and if I'd clicked, I would have received some uh, something bad. So. Um, don't get your news from your email. If something looks interesting, instead go to the news site and look there, don't click on an email. Social media, same thing. Uh, your friends are not foolproof. And because they forwarded something interesting, I just don't click on those things because I know that there are some things that are funny. My friend thought they were funny and they might forward it to me, but I'm just not going to trust it as uh, being secure. Um, Facebook and all social media, there are ads and um, you know the bad guys are using social media more and more. It's been long standing, but uh, just stay away from clicks on social media. Um, that's not universal, but this is a common sense thing. Okay, anything too good to be true, trying to make me curious, who wants to make me curious? Just don't get your news from your email. Unsubscribe, this is something you may or may not know, but I basically don't unsubscribe to things anymore. Uh, and the reason is unsubscribe, when you get a bad email, the unsubscribe button uh, might be exactly the thing they're trying to have you click on to deliver bad content. And uh, you know, if you get an email from Macy's, you, you've, you've um, subscribed, you, you know Macy's is having a one day, and you want to unsubscribe, go ahead, it's fine. That's, um, you, know, you know that they're a qualified vendor. But if you're not really certain about the source of the email, instead of unsubscribe, if you're using Outlook, you right click and choose junk and block sender. That has exactly the same impact as unsubscribe in that if that sender tries to send you another email, it will just be rejected automatically by your email filter and it will never reach your inbox. But the difference is this block sender doesn't communicate back to the sender that says so-and-so's email address has just unsubscribed. Uh, that information that 
so and so as unsubscribe can be used by the bad guys to initiate attack to confirm that this is really a real email address. Um, so careful with unsubscribe. Every email vendor, Gmail and so forth, has an alternative to this junk block sender. So you mark the thing as junk easily and don't unsubscribe. Uh, finally, this is uh, important. It's well understood that you want to hover over an email address or hover over a link. But what are you really looking for? So I'm going to uh, talk about how do you dis discern what is really the content in a URL. That's what shows up in your browser. Um, what is really the domain name? That's what is important. And so every URL has, it starts off with a moniker that's either HTTP or HTTPS. And a lot of people uh, mistakenly think that the S means it's secure. It means it's encrypted, but the bad guys have uh, encrypted websites as well. So you're not really doing yourself anything at all by saying, oh, this one has an S. It's uh, okay. No, that's not true. So anyway, then you have a, almost always www. Those are the common things that are in every good and bad um, URL. Next, that's what we want to look at. The domain name starts after the first period, ends before the first slash. Know how to evaluate this. So in this example, it's after the first period, before the first slash, example.com. Anything that follows after the slash, that's really not material. The Domain name is this one. And uh, so it can be long. So anything that happens before the first slash, that is the actual domain name. So the thing is, uh, bad guys will try and use what look like very credible uh, examples here. So there's a ups.com. There may be a ups.com slash shipments. Is there a shipments.ups.com or returns.ups.com? by changing the prefix, suffix, reverse order, uh, might be real. You, you, you just uh, don't want to assume, oh, that looks okay. You want to really look at it carefully. And if you're not certain that it's right, then don't click on it. And if you uh, think it might be, then go to that uh, source, but don't copy and paste. Instead, go type into your URL, shipment.ups.com, if that's what it is. And if it's okay, it will go to the right place. Um, and so that's different than clicking because clicking inside of an email executes some code that you don't know is there and um, might be doing something bad. If you're typing it into your URL, it's not executing any other code. So know how to evaluate the real domain name. Hopefully this is helpful. Um, click protection with 365. I mentioned this. If you make a bad click, this is the message that comes up instead of getting malware. So that's all I'll say about this. It's an important tool. Hopefully each of you are using this. So we've talked about email. I'm gonna quickly now move through endpoint protection. Basically you want antivirus, patch management, administrative controls, uh, vulnerability scans set to run, online security monitoring, and multi-factor authentication for users, for applications that user uses. Those are the basic things we're gonna to do to protect our endpoints. Home connections, I'm gonna talk about this for a minute. Um, in healthcare, this is used uh, more, uh, probably less frequently than in other kinds of organizations, but making sure that anybody who's working remotely, it's not just home, um, but remote connections need to be secured. So some things we do to protect, uh, one, make sure that home devices are protected. And a recommendation here is if you have somebody using their home PC, whether it's in the office or remotely connected from home, require or supply paid home antivirus. So there are free antivirus products. Um, basically, I don't re recommend free products, not because they don't have value, but because free products are almost always free because your information is the product and your information is sold. That's how they deliver useful product for free. So you can get free antivirus, but uh, it comes at a, at a risk. So anyway, um, if antivirus isn't in place on our own PC, then who knows what's running on that PC, what key loggers um, are in place. And if there's a key logger in place on a home PC, the home PC logs into your secure network, but they log in with the keys that the 
a real employee has, and now those keys have been given for free to whoever uh, infected the home PC. Require a VPN. This is an encrypted tunnel, and hopefully everybody's doing this now. If somebody's logging in remotely, they're doing so through a VPN. Um, and uh, that simply means that the login and password aren't in the clear when they're entered. They're uh, secure and can't be read by um, NSA or, or bad guys. Uh, passwords, another difficult one, prohibit password saving. That means if you have a, a work laptop, don't save your password because then, especially on a laptop, a laptop or tablet is lost or stolen and you've saved the password that logs into the office, that's a huge HIPAA liability risk. Um, and it's just really important. It's recommended for home devices, but certainly any work device, prohibit password saving on the device. Uh, and then have a policy that says no password reuse. This is easier said than done, but it is uh, important and everyone should be aware. For home PCs, uh, these can be evaluated. Uh, we can, at PBSO, we can do this easily, run a port scan on a home PC to know if it is set up in a secure or not secure way. Um, so if you're a PBSI client, just ask us, we'll check any home PCs you wish, uh, but you need to make sure that the home PC is secure if they're going to be used to log into your network. Uh, Internet of Things, this means not only in the office, but at home, folks need to uh, be aware. And basically the message is update firmware on all internet devices, TVs, Wi-Fi cameras. If this isn't done in a home, then the home network can be compromised through the security camera or the Nest, uh, and that creates vulnerabilities. The way to do this is quite straightforward. You go to the vendor's website, so samsung.com, and you uh, just search for firmware, and you, you need to know the model of your device, and you'll find firmware update, and um, it's almost always straightforward to do, but out-of-date firmware on home devices is the same as unupdated security patches. They're used by the bad guys to attack devices and get inside of networks. Um, and uh, many of our clients have PBSI do online security monitoring on the home PCs that are used for remote connection as well. So securing home connections is important. Okay, access control. I'm going to move quickly now. Timeout settings, uh, configure systems with automatic log off. So you probably have this on your EHR already, uh, where after such, such a period of time it logs out. And the recommendation I made earlier is set a screensaver that requires password re-entry. Um, make sure that your software is set to lock after a certain number of incorrect passwords. Uh, keep your user accounts unique. So hopefully you're not using a quote front desk password. Each person on the front desk has their own password. Um, that certainly minimizes the risk that one person's compromise can impact the organization. Um, make sure you have uh, well understood least privilege, uh, set your permissions to need to know basis. Uh, and hopefully that's already done in all healthcare organizations. And have your firewall set correctly. Uh, make sure that when employee leaves, their access is terminated. Um, Okay, data protection. I've talked about this so uh, everybody understands in healthcare that PHI, uh, there are categories of highly sensitive, sensitive, and other data. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this because hopefully this is already understood in the organization and you protect highly sensitive data in a different way. Uh, any PHI sent by email must be encrypted. Email is not secure. And make sure your data is backed up. HIPAA guidelines. This is an example, this article where I've yellow highlighted of uh, one recent HIPAA violation that was uh, required a practice to pay $100,000 for violating rules. Uh, zero mercy shed on every practice, large or small, is the message. This article is copied from a article uh, published. I'm not sure of the publisher. Um, so HHS has uh, implemented their zero tolerance policy. And so this 
practice, the employees of the practice were grossly misinformed when it came to knowing the rules and regulations of HIPAA. So what happened is a breach was reported, it was investigated, and they found that the effort that the practice put forth in protecting their patient information was inadequate. And because the effort was inadequate, the uh, fine occurred. Anybody who's doing your best and can document that to protect or, um, information, you're not going to be fined. It's where uh, you're grossly negligent and uh, you haven't trained employees and you haven't done a security risk assessment and you don't know where your um, vulnerabilities are and you haven't uh, obtained uh, business associate agreements with all appropriate vendors. Uh, if they see no risk analysis report, these are heads up. And in this case, there was a continuing failure on the part of this provider to comply. And the result was a $100,000 fine. So not trying to fear monger. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about security risk sub assessments in detail, but I will say that we find a lot of practices um, say there's a security risk assessment, but a thorough one really hasn't been done and it's not documented. You want to have a risk assessment document. PBS, I can help with this. Uh, we do these for practices. Uh, inexpensively with great expertise, but I'm not trying to sell PBSI services here. I'm simply saying that uh, you need to have a risk assessment that is current and updated annually where you're inventorying processes, that's documentation, people, which staff has actually been trained, technology, where are our vulnerabilities, which of the things that we should be doing, are we doing and not doing? You do not have to have 100% compliance. You don't have to have the, all the right check boxes of saying we're secure in all these areas. No, what you have to do is uh, answer the questions accurately, understand, okay, so there are six things here that these questions are asked and we didn't, we can't answer them positively. That is a risk assessment. That's what you need to do because the point is become aware of what you need to do. That's the point of a risk assessment, and then start taking action. So document, then your follow-up. Uh, these are all straightforward things, and uh, if this is something where you don't have uh, good documentation, feel free to contact us. We're happy to help. No charge consultations to start a process. Um, network security. This is uh, largely set up by IT, and I'm going to skip this for today's conversation. Medical device security, again, the information here, this would be in the category of Internet of Things, uh, lab equipment, imaging equipment, thermostats, cameras inside of the office, make sure your firmware is up to date, change default passwords, and uh, consider having those devices monitored. And finally, incident response plan, uh, in terms of the eight essential elements, this is the last, uh, make sure that you have documented what happens in the event of faster. Uh, what's the phone tree or email tree, who, who does what, where's the documentation stored. It's when that disaster occurs and the employee at the front desk says, what am I supposed to do now where uh, at their disposal needs to be available what they do now. Um, it's not quite that simple, but um, that's the essentials. And make sure that everybody's trained on HIPAA. PBS and I use a product for our own employees, and we do this for uh, many clients, a product called Know Before, that does HIPAA training, OSHA training, fish testing. It's really excellent and quite inexpensive. Um, and uh, it auto-documents when each employee's been trained. So this is a big part of being able to certify if an auditor calls. Yes, each employee's been trained, and it's automated for you. So uh, it works really well. It's inexpensive. If you have a good HIPAA training, plan in place and, and documented, then great. Uh, but there's a tool if you uh, want to know about it. And this is information about Know Before, which does training, fish testing, documenting. I won't go further. So in summary, secure the perimeter, protect our data, make sure our endpoints are secured, make sure our behavior is secured and our email is secured, our employees have been trained. That's uh, the essentials. So with that, we're finished with content today and um, I'm going to end recording.
But uh, once I do that, I'm going to stay on the line and anybody who would like to either by your chat or by unmuting ask questions, you're welcome to do so. So thanks for your attendance today.